Pakistan's political crisis deepens. The prime minister's opponents push to remove him from office. But Imran Khan blames a foreign conspiracy. How did Pakistan get to this point? And what will the fallout mean for the country? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mohammed Jamjoum. It's one of the biggest tests in the career of former cricket star turned Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan. He tried to delay a vote in Parliament to oust him. But his opponents say the tide's been turning against him for some time. MPs met to debate his fate after the Supreme Court ruled Khan's attempt to dissolve Parliament and call new elections was unconstitutional. Opposition members accuse him of failing to root out corruption and fix the struggling economy. But Khan says there's a U.S.-backed conspiracy to remove him. He hasn't provided any evidence, and Washington denies the allegations. Khan is refusing to recognize an opposition government and has urged his supporters to protest. Osama bin Javed has more from the capital, Islamabad. Never a dull moment, they say, in Pakistan's politics. An assembly which was dissolved by the president held its session. The parliament members who were part of the Pakistan Tehreek e Insaf, Imran Khan's government, uh, all set to vote against him. And a session which was ordered to have taken place and continue only with an agenda of a vote seems to be taking a long time. Uh, we've been speaking to politicians from both the government and the opposition. This impetus of trying to oust Imran Khan remains a foreign conspiracy. And what opposition MPs say is that that's a joke. That this joke cannot be carried on. Uh, there's only one decision that there is a constitutional no confidence in the parliament against this, against the prime minister according to the democratic norms and rules and constitution. And the only only thing that Imran Khan has to face today is the no confidence, no confidence voting and to be ousted by vote by democracy in Pakistan. Despite the opposition benches insisting the government is holding its fort, it's saying that this is an issue which the opposition told the court that it not, did not debate, it did not get a chance to debate the vote on the floor of the House. And here are government MPs giving them a chance to raise their opinions and discuss it why Imran Khan needs to go. Their narrative that we didn't allow the debate to happen. They didn't want a debate, they wanted to hurry the vote because their main fear is the following. If the Supreme Court, the current case, which is on Article 63A, if they decide under Article 631A that yes, members who have decided not to vote with Khan are therefore defectors in advance of the vote, then what happens to them? So before the Supreme Court judgment comes, they're trying to rush the vote. And while this debate goes on in the National Assembly, the reason Pakistan is here is because in the last three and a half years, all the tall promises that were made during the campaign when Imran Khan came to power have not been fulfilled. Uh, there is rising inflation, the rupee is losing its value, the country's economy seems to be spiraling downwards, and more importantly, the powerful military establishment in Pakistan seems to be no longer supporting Imran Khan, which the accusation from the opposition is that Imran Khan only came to power with their backing, and they are now playing a neutral role. All eyes on the, this important and historic session of the National Assembly, and according to court orders, before this session is over, there has to be a vote of no confidence, and there must be a new leader of the House, and that is going to be decided once the vote takes place. For Inside Story, I'm Sama bin Javed. All right, let's take a look at how Imran Khan got to this point. The cost of living is high in Pakistan, with food prices up by 23% since the beginning of the pandemic. Opposition parties blame Khan for the economic turmoil and growing foreign debt. Pressure came to a head when Imran Khan's close ally, the Mutahida Qaumi Movement Party, quit his government and switched sides before the no-confidence vote, reducing his majority in the assembly. His relationship with the army is also shaky, with differences over foreign policy decisions. All right, let's go ahead and bring in our guests in Rawalpindi in Pakistan, Saira Asad, adjunct assistant professor at Rifa International University. In London, Aisha Siddiqa, senior fellow in the Department of War Studies at King's College London. And in Washington, D.C., Farahnaz Ispahani, writer and former member of the National Assembly of Pakistan. A warm welcome to you all. Thanks so much for joining us today on Inside Story. Saira, let me start with you today. 
Just how volatile is the political situation in Pakistan right now? Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, right now, these, uh, uh, you know, political upheaval is going on in Pakistan. Uh, at present, uh, you know, the vote of no confidence, our prime minister is facing that. Uh, earlier, a prime minister of Pakistan, uh, you know, uh, just, uh, you know, uh, uh, suggested president of Pakistan to dissolve the uh, National Assembly. But that, uh, you know, uh, the decision has been nullified by the Supreme Court of Pakistan uh, yesterday. And today they are facing the vote of no confidence. And uh, we are looking forward uh, how it's going to work out for that. But uh, uh, on the fact, uh, fact, factual ground, we can see that the opposition uh, is having, uh, uh, you know, uh, the desired number of uh, votes. Uh, and we are just looking forward uh, how it's mm -hmm. going to be, uh, you know, uh, move, move about. Uh, Farah Hanaza, how long has the tide been turning against Imran Khan? Well, uh, most of us who consider ourselves Democrats would say right from the beginning, um, we consider Mr. Khan not to be the elected prime minister of Pakistan. He's always been referred to as the selected prime minister of Pakistan because he was brought in by the aid of the military establishment. Um, but however, uh, the opposition parties have, for the sake of democracy, um, played ball, remained in the game, and um, where we are today is literally just democracy in work. The former prime minister didn't have the votes. He tried to violate the constitution. It went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court declared that Mr. Khan's actions were unconstitutional and demanded that a vote of no confidence be um, carried out in parliament. And that is what we are watching right now. Aisha, how much tension is there right now between Imran Khan and the military? You see, there are no clear answers to your question. But if I could just add one more piece of information, what we've seen this morning, and, you know, it's it's this whole game of no confidence uh, motion against the prime minister and the way Imran Khan government is trying to stop it, delay, uh, postpone the action, uh, or postpone the inevitable, you know, in, in its, against uh, against its government, is, you know, right now they're filibustering it. They're filibustering in the parliament. They're trying to delay it. On the surface of it, we see that there is a tension between military and, uh, and Imran Khan, which is the reason he, uh, you know, uh, that they, they seem to have agreed to play the role of a neutral in politics, where they didn't do, where they hadn't done in 2018 elections. But, you know, when I look at it, there is a very uncomfortable feeling. I mean, don't ask me for evidence, but there is an uncomfortable feeling that there are elements within the military within which continue to support Khan. And the reason I say that no evidence, because you, you can't produce such evidence, but what when we compare the, the way uh, Khan, uh, you know, which, you know, uh, apparently the army chief no longer uh, supports him, uh, support, supports his actions. But in case of previous governments who had lost uh, faith with the military or who had, had, had you mm -hmm. know, uh, who had a tense relationship with, with the military, mm -hmm. they were treated much worse. I mean, there would be so much propaganda against them. Compare it with what Khan is facing at the moment. There's hardly any propaganda ex uh, against him. A few stories here and there of, of possible corruption, involvement in corruption, his wife's, uh, the first lady's involvement in, in, in corruption, but nothing really as substantial mm -hmm. as what Nawaz Sharif faced or, uh, or the People's Party government fa faced, which makes me imagine uh, or think that perhaps there is still some support uh, within the military. Definitely, he was a popular candidate with the military. Ideologically, they couldn't have been more aligned with any political leader than they are with Imran Khan. Mm. Uh, Saira, um, I want to 
take a step back and look at the economic situation right now in Pakistan. On Thursday, the Pakistani rupee fell to an all-time low against the U.S. dollar. But on Friday, markets opened on a positive note because there was this hope that the political crisis might be ending soon. How much worse could the economic situation get in Pakistan if this political crisis is not resolved soon? Uh, yes. Uh, actually, we can't say that. That's all uh, because of the current uh, political uh, disturbances. Uh, actually, uh, when the last government uh, went, uh, the Pakistan was facing, uh, you know, a turmoil, uh, economic uh, turmoil, uh, turmoil at that time also. Uh, but uh, right now, it has just emerged and the opposition has uh, taken a strict stance. Uh, they have just bought one point of inflation. And uh, yes, there is, you know, uh, uh, prices, uh, there are a lot of, you know, we can see that a lot of uh, um, uh, prices are raised in everything that we can see the factory prices and the daily, you know, necessities are uh, uh, they are very, very expensive uh, for a common man to afford that all. Uh, but uh, it is going to be like the same because uh, the stability will come with the passage of time. Pakistan needs a stable economic plan at that movement uh, because it's, uh, but uh, all the, uh, you know, this, this uh, political disturbance has uh, made, uh, again, more difficult for Pakistan to survive. So we are looking forward for a smooth functioning of a government and we are looking forward for the early elections uh, because uh, we need a uh, you know, stable government. When we look at the, uh, the past, uh, we can see that the Pakistan always faced, uh, you know, uh, these uh, type of political disturbances. Only uh, three prime ministers of Pakistan were able to you know, complete four years term, not even five years term, mm -hmm. uh, in which uh, we can see that Yusuf Reza Gilani and Nawaz Sharif in 2013 to 2017, and now the Imran Khan, he has has just you know completed his uh, fourth year the fifth year mm -hmm. uh you know the same pattern is being you know implemented again and again in the last year it seems like that the last year the uh, other political parties just you know uh group together and mm -hmm. just uh, you know uh, make a smooth uh path for their upcoming elections so it seems like that by looking at the, the current uh, atmosphere the political atmosphere uh, that the early elections are going to be held in Right. Pakistan. I think so that is going to be the I main solution of the crisis. Uh, and today, uh, Saira, the I'm sorry to interrupt. Saira, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you, you, you bring up the topic of, of potentially uh, early elections. And I do want to ask Farah Naz about that. Uh, Farah Naz, what's the earliest that elections could happen going forward? Well, I think a reason why Mr. Imran Khan um, has done a lot of these dramatics is he wants early elections. He wants to be seen as the martyr thrown out of office. And then he expects that his followers will turn up and vote him into office again. But what I'm reading at the moment is if he continues down this path of um, ignoring the Supreme Court, um, you know, ruling and of uh, behaving in this undemocratic, autocratic way, um, I think we may end up with um, uh, some kind of a technocratic government that may remain for much longer. Because let's be honest, what he has done to the economy of Pakistan. I was recently in Pakistan. I have never seen the cost of living and the cost for people who are not sitting in the capital of Islamabad or Pindi, mm -hmm. the people who are living in Karachi and in interior of Sindh, et cetera. It has, it's, it's quite horrendous. It is terrifying. What he has done to Pakistan's foreign policy, the U.S. has been our biggest aid giver. Now he's accused the U.S. of this, these conspiracy theories of trying to remove him from office and these secret ciphers which nobody has seen. He has created a political diplomatic mm -hmm. and economic crisis, the likes of which we have never seen. So you asked me about early elections. If he continues down this path, he doesn't accept the, 
ruling of the Supreme Court today mm-hmm. and allows the opposition. You know, what um, Dr. Sarah just said was so incorrect, and many people don't realize this. Pakistan is not a presidential system. In a parliamentary democracy, the minute the opposition has the numbers, they can topple any government. It happens in the UK. It happens anyway. That's what a vote of no confidence is about. So no government comes in with a term of five years. This is something where I feel people don't understand the Pakistani system of government. Mm. So to elections, I'm skeptical. But let's wait and see. Aisha, um, you heard uh, Farah Nazir talk about um, this conspiracy that Imran Khan is talking about. He's been blaming the U.S. for a, for a conspiracy to, to get him un, unseated. Of course, the U.S. denies this. Um, does the public in Pakistan believe this? Okay, again, let me go back to a couple of things which you, questions you'd ask the, the other speakers. Uh, firstly, um, economy had started uh, to recover uh, until Pakistan was recently starting uh, this year hit by inflation and very bad inflation of that. January, it was 11%. Today, it is 15.1%. And that inflation really hits people. Um, The other thing is that even if elections uh, are to be held, he has promised 90 days, but due to technical structural reasons, they can't be held in 90 days. Because uh, once the Election Commission of Pakistan uh, announces elections, it needs a minimum to of four to five months to uh, allow for delimitation of constituencies. There are new districts that have been made by Imran Khan government. And if you go by the 2017 election, uh, election Act, which was consolidating all the rules that existed so far in election, then it seems very clear that nothing before five to six months. Yes, I mean, the other option, of course, is that somehow a national government is installed. But the question is, who will install the government? I mean, the parliamentary procedures do not allow for it. Uh, so the no confidence motion has to go through. I mean, Imran Khan really has to wreck the country uh, to ensure that, uh, you know, or force, force military's hand. Military itself, I mean, there have been now judgments, Supreme Court judgments, uh, against uh, emergencies by, by the military, uh, highlighting that anyone who subverts the, the constitution is a traitor. Mm-hmm. So that's another ball game, totally uh, another thing. Now, to your question about what happens with, uh, you know, with this conspiracy, you know, various, the, the simple answer to that is that this conspiracy is actually, it actually is popular among on the streets. And one of the reasons that he is constantly uh, referring to the conspiracy, American conspiracy, is uh, these two reasons. One, increases popularity amongst people. Mm -hmm. And secondly, uh, increases popularity amongst the first and second tier military officers. Mm. Uh, I mean, going by... Aisha, I'm sorry to uh, to interrupt you. We're just starting to to run out of time. Um, Syra, let me ask you... What do you expect that Imran Khan's next move might be? We can see that by the number of oppositions declaring that they have uh, 176 seats uh, and uh, in the National Assembly. And after that, uh, definitely he is going to declare the next election. Uh, And uh, by the approval of the uh, National Assembly, if they are going to approve him as a prime minister for the last Term till the uh, you know uh, till uh, the next election he can stay there. Uh, otherwise uh, he, he will uh, have to you know uh, leave the seat and he has to appoint another uh, you know uh, at his uh, place uh, to run the country. Uh, so uh, at the moment it is uh, very difficult to say uh, what is going to happen. It is all dependent and we are just looking at the current scenario. What is going to happen? Farah Hanaz, um, do you think that we might see a concerted effort from here on out to try and improve Pakistan's relationship with the U.S.? Is that something that's in the cards going forward? Well, you know, um, ever since Pakistan was founded, our founder, like Turkey's founder, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, our founder, Mr. Jinnah, 
the first thing he did was send someone to Washington, D.C., because he understood, even though we were situated all the way in South Asia, that the U.S. relationship was what we needed. Unlike India and its relationship with Russia and wanting to be non-aligned, Pakistan always wanted to be aligned with the U.S. By that, I mean Pakistan's military and most of Pakistan's governments. That is not the feeling in the street, but I do believe that the permanent establishment in Pakistan does understand that they have to rescue um, the relationship, not just with the US, but with a lot of European countries who have really become quite tired of this drama and they realize they don't want an unstable Pakistan. So let's see going forward. I hope Mr. Khan today accepts the vote mm -hmm. and goes willingly. If he doesn't, I'm afraid there might be some other measures which may be undemocratic. Aisha, Imran Khan has said that he refuses to recognize an opposition government, um, and he has also urged his supporters to come out and protest. Do you think that his supporters are going to be coming out onto the streets and staging protests in the days ahead? I don't think that he's going to get hundreds and thousands of people out of the streets, not one consolidated protest. But definitely what I can see is much more, uh, you know, chaos within the society. I mean, already the society is very divided. His his uh, his supporters are extremely aggressive. I mean, recently we saw his MPAs, his member of provincial assembly in Sin, hanging effigies of opposition party leaders. Uh, I mean, how horrible uh, was the sight? I mean, how horrible is this idea? I mean, and they are so aggressive. They're ready to, uh, you know, to to punish physically punish uh, opposition leaders. In London itself, where, where you have rule of law, in the last one week, there were at least two attacks, physical attacks on uh, Nawaz Sharif's, uh, no, non Nawaz Sharif. And in one of the attacks, is, uh, his guards were seriously injured. And this is by PTI supporters. So just imagine what they are capable of doing in Pakistan. I don't think he has ever trained his party to do politics. Uh, so, you know, protests of that kind. I mean, the, the protests that he held earlier in 2017 were with the army's help. But this time, they're going, there's going to be more aggression. Uh, that is my, my, my main worry. And I think that is put, going to put off a lot of the world with looks at Pakistan. And Aisha, Pakistan really has begun to appear like a basket case. Uh, Aisha, we, we have less than a minute left. I just want to ask you very quickly, um, how much concern is there in Pakistan right now about how, how large this constitutional crisis could get? Well, I think that we are standing at a point at, at you know, horn of the dilemma where uh, somebody, a uh, force, which is the army's for hand, a secret hand can force uh, some something out. I think this is a serious crisis and it can, you know, it will eventually, we're, we're at a point when there is a resolution because the Supreme Court, through its intervention, something has to be done. Well, we have run out of time, so we're going to have to leave the conversation there. Thanks so much to all of our guests, Saira Asad, Aisha Siddiqui, and Farah Naz Ispahani. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. For me, Mohammed Jamjoum, and the whole team here in Doha, bye for now.